The National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of the world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the peoples whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Pacific Story comes to you tonight from Hollywood and New York as another public service with drama of the past and present and commentary by the celebrated author, for many years a resident and student of China, Pearl Buck. Sun Yat-sen, father of the Republic of China. This is the voice of the Chinese people. Who will help us to be free? Out of the bosom of China rose one who was destined to lead the way. Sun Yat-sen! Sun Yat-sen! Sun Yat-sen! Nineteen years ago today, March 12, 1925, Dr. Sun Yat-sen died. To China, thirsting for freedom, he left this last will and testament. For 40 years, I have devoted myself to the cause of the people's revolution with but one end in view, the elevation of China to a position of freedom and equality among the nations. My experiences during these 40 years have convinced me that to attain this goal, we must bring about an awakening of our own people and ally ourselves in a common struggle with those peoples of the world who treat us as equals. The revolution is not yet finished. Above all, my recent declarations in favor of holding a national convention of the people of China and abolishing the unequal treaties should be carried into effect as soon as possible. This is my last will and testament. Freedom and equality among nations. Sun Yat-sen had become immortal as the father of the Chinese Republic. In him, the fire of freedom burned for 40 years. Through Sun Yat-sen, a new China was born. Thus, the Chinese people speak. We saw him preaching the revolution while he was a medical student in Hong Kong. Every moment he was not studying in the laboratories, he spread his ideas among his fellow students. We look at what happened when France attacked us in 1884. While our Chinese soldiers were fighting and dying and winning the war on the battlefront, our Manchu rulers were making a disgraceful peace. Yat-sen, you came here to study medicine, not to worry about politics. Are you afraid of the truth I speak? It is foolishness. Who listens to you? Well, well, Chen, Niu Xiaoqi, and Yang. Yes, you four. All you four do is talk of the revolution. Yes. That is why everyone calls you the four great and inseparable scoundrels. You may avoid me as one stricken with a plague, but the time will come when you... Sun Yat-sen graduated and became a doctor. Then his revolutionary activities became greater. Then, in 1894, Japan attacked China and took Formosa. We suffered another humiliating defeat. We Chinese rebelled against this disgraceful peace, and Sun Yat-sen plotted to capture the headquarters of the provincial government at Canton. We are bringing in pistols, rifles, ammunition, and dynamite from Hong Kong. Enlistments are growing. We have been preparing for half a year now, and soon we will be ready to strike. We must make every effort to see that... But before they could strike, their plot was discovered. Three of Sun Yat-sen's men were executed. Seventy were arrested. But Sun Yat-sen himself escaped. 
In Macau, he saw a notice posted for his arrest. What a... Sun Yat-sen. Ten thousand taels for his capture. At Hong Kong, a lawyer warned him. Peking's arm is still a long one. Whichever part of the world you go to, you must expect to have this arm reaching for you. Sun Yat-sen fled to Kobe, Japan. He bought a modern Japanese suit of clothes, went to his hotel and put it on. Then he placed himself before the mirror and took out his sharp knife. What are you doing, Yat-sen? I'm going to cut off my cue. Your cue? No, no, you cannot. Stand aside. I've made up my mind. But all Chinese wear the cue. There. Oh. Throw it away. Yat-sen, what have you done? It is the custom of It is Chinese? a custom brought to our country by the Manchus. The symbol of acceptance of the Manchu dynasty. Hereafter, I shall dress like a Westerner. I shall let my mustache grow. I shall wear my hair as Western men wear theirs. I shall never again accept the rule of the Manchus. <laughs> Sun Yat-sen then went to Hawaii, then to San Francisco. He was changed indeed, but not enough. He preached the revolution to the Chinese, but few paid attention to him. Few except enemies who were paid to watch him. Detectives reported his every move to the Chinese minister in Washington, D.C. We have just received word from San Francisco, sir, that Sun Yat-sen is sailing from New York for Liverpool on September the 23rd. He is going to London? Yes, sir. He will arrive at Liverpool on September the 30th and in London, October the 1st. Cable the Chinese minister in London at once. Send him all this information along with an accurate description of Sun Yat-sen's foreignized appearance. Advisement be on the lookout for him and to... In London, Sun Yat-sen called on his old friend, Dr. James Cantley. They talked of Dr. Sun's college days while he was studying medicine under Dr. Cantley in China. Ten days after his arrival in London, Dr. Sun was stopped on the street by a Chinese and drawn into the Chinese legation building. He was lured into a room on the third floor, and suddenly the door closed behind him. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I am Sir Halliday McCartney, English advisor to the Chinese legation. How do you do? We have received word from Washington concerning a Chinese political criminal named Sun Wen. You know him? No. We are informed that Sun Wen took passage for England some weeks ago. Well? It is the belief of the Chinese legation that you are Sun Wen. So if you don't mind, would you be kind enough to stay here with us until we can communicate with the Manchu court in Peking? I shall return after... Sun Yat-sen knew that it meant death to be sent back to China. But Sir Halliday had his prisoner. Now he had the task of getting him back to China without interference. The only method we see of returning him to Peking that would be sufficiently secret would be by chartering a ship. Would the Chinese government authorize this expensive outlay? If not, please send other instructions. The days dragged by. In his imprisonment on the top floor of the legation, Sun Yat-sen foresaw the torture and execution that would be his when he was delivered into the hands of the Manchus. He tried to smuggle out notes. He threw notes with money in them out of the window, but nothing happened. Then he got an idea. Dr. Sun was a Christian, and as such, he appealed to the English servants who brought his food. So you see, just as the Sultan of Turkey wishes to kill all the Christians of Armenia, so the Emperor of China wishes to kill me because I am a Christian. Blimey. Is that right? You wouldn't wish me killed because I am a Christian, would you? That I wouldn't, no. My life is in your hands. How do you mean, sir? Here, you get this note out to Dr. James Cantley. The address is on the envelope, you see? Yes, but I... If you get this letter to Dr. James Cantley, I shall be saved. If not, I shall be executed. Yes, sir, I'll carry it out in this coal scuttle, sir, and I hope the guards at the door will not see it. It was nearly midnight on October the 17th when the doorbell of Dr. Cantley's home rang. Hmm. Strange. I could have sworn I heard the doorbell ring. Uh, oh, hello. What's this? A letter slipped under the door. There is a friend of yours imprisoned in the Chinese legation since last Sunday. They intend sending him out to China where it is certain they will hang him. I dare not sign my name, but this is the truth, so believe what I say. Whatever you do must be done at once, or it will be too late. His name is, I believe, Sin Yin Sen. It's Sun Yat Sen. Good heavens! 
Sorry, Dr. Cantley. Scotland Yard cannot consider this any of our business. My advice is to drop the whole matter. Very interesting, Dr. Cantley, but it scarcely has any news value to the London Times. We'll pigeonhole it. You may call our procedure red tape, Dr. Cantley, but in the Foreign Office, such matters must go through certain channels. Therefore, Dr. Cantley, this court must deny a writ of habeas corpus for the said Dr. Sun Yat Sen. Dr. Cantley, I'm a reporter from the Globe. Yes? I just got a tip on this Chinese. They're holding prison at delegation. And of your efforts to free him. Do you mind telling me about him? Tell you. Come in, sir. I'll tell you all about him. The story came out in the London Globe, and within a short time, reporters from every paper in London besieged Sir Halliday McCartney at the Chinese legation. Why are you holding that Chinese prisoner here? Is it true you're trying to smuggle him back to China? Why do you want to chop his head off? Look here, look here, look here. Here, here. One at a time. Yes, we're holding him here, but of course we're going to release him. There was no other way. Dr. Sun was released. The next day, the sum of 6,000 pounds was cabled from Peking to send Sun Yat-sen back to China. And now Dr. Sun set about with more zeal than ever to organize the revolution. He traveled widely, dressed in his plain, cheap clothes. He lived with friends or in cheap rooms. He ate in cheap restaurants. He looked worn and weary, but everywhere he went... He gathered Chinese about him and preached the revolution. We must model the new government on the American government. A republic with the people voting. We are ready to tear down the throne of the emperor. The people are ready. But the foreign powers, will they stand by the Manchus? Yes, of course. They have fattened themselves on the empire. Concessions, loans. They plot to partition China. We must succeed without them. Partition China? Never. We must overthrow the Manchus by force. With no army? The government has no army either. <laughs> for once, I'm glad the old empress spent the money given her for a navy to build a palace for herself. The government <laughs> has no navy. Neither have we. We have the people. They are on our side, millions strong. Are you steadfast? Forever. 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 I need money. We will get it for you. Do Don't not think money. of money. I am only a laundryman, Dr. Sun. I have not been home to China in 20 years. What is this? All I have saved in 20 years to take me home. I I want to give it for a new China. How much money do you need, Dr. Sun? How can I tell? I am a merchant. Whatever you need, count on me. And on me. I am a merchant, too. Count on me. Here is my pledge. Here is my money. Here is my... Take Take my money. We saw him everywhere. In Hong Kong, Hawaii, French Indochina, Japan, and the Malay States, the Dutch Islands, and New York, San Francisco, Philadelphia. In Brussels, Paris, Berlin... He gained the support of secret societies in China and abroad. And while he worked, our revolution rolled up with terrible power. In October 1911... Kill the Manchus! Kill the Manchus! Out of the palace is the lazy, greedy Manchus! Kill the Manchus! Kill her! Out the mouth of the city! West of America, Sun Yat-sen was on his way to a restaurant for breakfast. Huxley! Huxley! Revolution in China! Revolution in China! Boy? Yes, sir. Paper, please. Thanks. Wu Chang, taken by a revolutionist. It has come. The Imperial Artillery and Engineering Corps at Wu Chang has gone over to the revolutionists. They have taken Wu Chang and are marching on Hanyang with its steel mills and arsenals. At last... After all these years... He stood there, alone, unrecognized, weary and shabby. Then he bought a ticket for New York. As he traveled eastward, he followed the developments of the revolution. 